Please be seated as I pray. Lord God, what a wonderful thought it is that you came to this earth. Lord, and thinking back on those shepherds who heard this message, Lord, and thinking back on, on what a joy it was to hear their Messiah had come. Lord, help us to um, remember that well during this season. Lord, as we come to your table, Lord, to remember you and what you did on the cross, Lord, help us to, um, to just focus on that, to remove everything that is distracting us this morning, Lord, to come meet with you. In your name, amen. Hi, thank you for being here this morning. Um, there are men in the front with Bibles, and they want to hand them out. Um, just raise your hand if you don't have a Bible, and they'll bring one to you. And if you don't own a Bible, this is our gift to you. So feel free to take it home. Uh, we'll be looking at 1 Peter chapter 2 this morning. Um, and so if you want to go ahead and turn there, um, I'll get there in a second. Today is our membership in Baptism Sunday, which honestly is my favorite Sunday every time. Um, I love hearing how God saves sinners, how he transforms lives, and what he's done to intersect with lives to bring them to him. Today, as we look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, I want to read together what God does and how God categorizes those whom he saved. Um, so read with me. Verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter describes the believer in four ways and with one purpose in this passage. Let's read those four ways again. But you, and he's speaking to Christians here, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Titles are important to us, aren't they? As I started thinking about this, I was surprised how often we put ourselves into categories. I started listing out titles and categories that I've put myself in over my life, and I was surprised how long that list is. Think about it. In this room, there are students, there are teachers, there are engineers, there are company presidents, there's brothers, sisters, fathers, sons, Arizonans, Michiganders, Californians. If we sat here, we could brainstorm 100 in no time. We take a lot of pride in the categories we put ourselves in. We get excited about sports related to those categories, whether it's the Olympics or college sports or even local sports used to be. We describe ourselves in that category. I worked at Intel for over a decade, and I still watch that company because I feel a connection to my former Intel employer. I work hard. We work hard for our titles at work, whether it's supervisor, manager, director, president. These show something about what the people around us think about and think of us. We feel connected to our titles. I love being a brother, being a son, being a father. God has been kind to us to show his affection for us in this passage by giving us four titles. We get to see four ways that God looks at Christians. And so I want to look at those four ways a little bit more closely. The first way is we're a chosen race. This connects back to Israel in the Old Testament. In fact, all of these are references to God's people of the Old Testament. Isaiah 43, 20, and 21, God declares, he will provide water in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself. God chose a people for himself. And we know elsewhere from scripture that this choosing is not based on what we did, but based only on him wanting to give us an opportunity to be associated with him. The next title is a royal priesthood. I believe this designation is a reminder that we are set apart as Christians, not just set apart by association, but set apart by obedience. In 1 Peter 1, 2, Christians are to be sanctified and set apart from the peoples of the world. The modifier royal is apt, for Christians know God as their king to whom they now owe allegiance. We're a holy nation. This passage is continuing a the theme and reminding us that we are completely set apart as Christians. We live in a society that is not a lot different than the readers of this book. Everyone worshiped many gods, and the gospel preached one true God. This rubbed people very wrong back then, 
and the same message rub pe rubs people wrong today. Today, the world is closed-minded. The world sees us as closed-minded if we stand for one truth. Everyone today will say they believe what is best for them. That isn't truth. If we stand for one truth, we are set apart as a nation. And the last title is a people for God's own possession. This literally speaks of the unique, private, personal ownership of the saints of God. I'm going to say that again. This literally speaks of the unique, private, and personal ownership of the saints of God. Being God's possession is amazing because of who he is, and he's, we're his possession. When I mentioned our titles earlier, I mentioned my continued thought to associate myself with a former employer. If that employer's reputation were significantly tarnished, I wouldn't be so quick to associate myself with them. God is the Lord of the universe. He is the one that sent his son to save sinners. Being able to be associated with him is something very significant. Which leads us to the rest of the verse. Knowing who we are in Christ leads us to and can lead us to only one place. Look at the rest of verse 9. It says, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are in a place where none of this was true of us. We were running from God as fast as we could, and he made us a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people for his own possession for one purpose, so we could tell the world about his excellencies. What are some of these excellencies? I'll list them off. God is so independent that he doesn't even need us. God is eternal. God is the final standard of good. And all that God is and does is worthy of glory. God is separate from sin and incorruptible. God cannot change. God is all-powerful. God transcends all space and is not subject to its limitations. And God fills every part of space with his entire being. God is all-knowing. God is perfectly righteous, perfectly just. God is love. This God has made you his possession. This is a humbling thought. Do we share his excellencies? Do we proclaim his excellencies to those around us? As I said before, we live in a society that looks at absolute truth and says it's closed-minded. Are you shy about who you are in Christ? Are you slow to brag about your God? I know I can be. I know I don't want to be. Today we receive the bread and the juice, and I want you to think of ways that you can proclaim his excellencies this week. We're at a time of the year where Jesus is on people's minds. It isn't hard to transition to those kinds of conversations, and I would encourage you to do that this week. If you're here this morning, and you're one that doesn't put your faith in Jesus to save you from your sins, maybe by your own examination, you fight against the idea of a true God and one that would save, send his son to die for your sins. I want to speak to you for a minute. I want you to go, I want you to think about this same section in a very real way. No matter what you think is good enough, you have fallen short of the holiness of God. Jesus came to earth to save sinners. This act of love and mercy is put on full display when we confess our sins and see his position towards us change through Christ's death on the cross. I want to beg you this morning to recognize your sin. Recognize how God sees your sin and seek his forgiveness. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He went to the cross to bear the punishment of your sins. He, he asks that you believe in him for eternal life, and he will give you these four titles. However, if you do not do that, please let the cup and bread pass. This time of communion is a time of worship reserved for those who put their trust in God. If you have any questions, please see me, any one of the elders, or the person you came with after the service. And we'd love to talk to you about our Savior. Men, can you please do this, or serve us? And as you are served, take communion on your own this morning. I'll come back and close this in prayer.